Did you know that the first observation of a photovoltaic effect took place in 1839? Yes, you heard me right, 1839. The first practical solar cell wasn't produced until 1954. Since then, we have come a very long way when it comes to solar cell technology. But did you know that there is a new horizon coming into focus for solar cell technology? Oh yes, we're talking about solar cells optimized for indoor applications. These are definitely not your grandparents' photovoltaic cells. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Solar cell technology is more popular than ever before, but we have only begun to scratch the surface when it comes to new applications for photovoltaic cell technology. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Chris Burkett from TDK joins me to discuss the basics of photovoltaic cells, what sets TDK's solar cells away from other solar cell technology on the market today, and the cool new applications that take advantage of this powerful technology. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from TDK. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Good to talk to you again. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about solar cells specifically designed for indoor applications today. But before we get started, Chris, can you give us a refresher on the basics of photovoltaic cells? Of course. So photovoltaic cells are actually semiconductor devices. They take the photons of light and convert it into electrical current via the photovoltaic effect. It is both an electrical and a chemical phenomenon. Silicon or some other base material is doped with another material, phosphorus, to add an extra valence electron, which creates an n-type material. And these are paired with another silicon layer that is also doped, but with a different material, in the case of silicon, that would be boron, to create a material depleted of electrons or with what we call electron holes, and it creates a p-type material. When these two materials are placed together, a depletion layer is created where the electrons fill the electron holes and forms a barrier region. As the electrons drift from the n-type material into this barrier region, they leave behind positive charged ions. And again, this would be phosphorus in the n-type material. And conversely, as the holes leave the p-type material to create that barrier region, they leave behind negative charged ions. In this case, it would be boron. Typically, the n-type layer is stacked on top towards the transparent electrode, and the p-type material is down towards the metal electrode at the bottom. However, in the case of thin films, it can be either material that is up towards the transparent conductive electrode. And by doing this, you're creating a p-n junction, which has an electrical field across it, or in the case of some of the thin films, they add an intrinsic semiconductor layer to form a pin p-i-n stack up which basically does the same thing as the PN junction. Photovoltaic cells absorb photons of light that introduce energy and cause electrons within the barrier region to break free, push them, them out of their covalent bond and flow back into the n-type material, and thus the holes will flow back into the p-type material. These free electrons can then be used to flow out through an external circuit and back into the p-type material and thus back into the barrier region, causing an electrical current needed to maintain the electrical field in the barrier region. The more light of high enough energy level that gets absorbed into the depletion layer, and the higher that luminance intensity is, the more electrical current that will be produced. Prominent photovoltaic materials are silicon-based, compounds such as copper, indium, gallium, selenide, cadmium, telluride, and also organic-based materials containing carbon. So, Chris, what kind of factors come into play when we're talking about solar cell output power? So, as I mentioned, the, the luminance intensity is one of the measures that generate output power. And as you can see by the, the plot on the left, there's a direct relationship between power and luminance. The units for luminance is lux. One lux equals one lumen per meter square. Or it's also a measure of the luminous flux per meter square, and it is a measure of intensity. The plot on the right is power versus active area size. This is important for a couple reasons. 
obviously, the larger the area, the higher the power. And then finally, the spectral response compared to the light source is very important as we look at the different TV technologies and light source responses. Okay, so Chris, can we dig into the details of this kind of output power a bit more? Yes. So in characterizing photovoltaic cells, a couple of key parameters are ISC, which is the short circuit current, VOC, which is the open circuit voltage, operating current, and operating voltage. So if we look at the curves on the left, this tells you that the maximum current that a given cell will produce is at the short circuit conditions. But that's not the use case. So there will be a lower operating current capable of being generated by the solar cells. And then with the voltage, the same thing happens. So open circuit would be the optimum or maximum voltage value that could be produced. And then the operating voltage will be at some reduced level. What are these reduced levels? It all depends on the solar cell technology, the size and shape of the cells, and also how many of the cells are stacked in series, thus creating higher voltages and lower current, or more in parallel to generate less voltage but higher current. If you look on the right side, I've highlighted a single cell. So when I'm talking about internal cells of a solar cell, there are four individual internal cells. So it's the area highlighted in the blue box that dictates what the current is. And then if the four cells are put into series, that means that there will be a higher output voltage generated by this cell. If they're all put in parallel, then it would be a lower voltage but higher current. I short circuit is the no load maximum. V out is proportional to the number of cells in series. And V open circuit is the maximum voltage under no load conditions. Typically, the no load maximum voltage is around 0.5 volts to 0.6 volts per cell. Okay, so Chris, these types of PV cells come in different types, right? Can you break down the differences for us? Of course. So PVs can be categorized into first, second, and third generation cells. First generation are also called conventional cells, sometimes traditional cells, and are made with semiconductor silicon wafers, just like a, a semiconductor integrated circuit. They are all crystalline silicon types, either mono or polycrystalline. These are the type that most people are familiar with as you're driving down the road. You look at rooftop solar cells or solar panels. Many of these are the crystalline silicon type. In recent years, they've gone to some other thin film types, but early on, all of them were crystal silicon. And currently, crystal silicon has about 75% of all solar cell solar panel market share. The second generation photovoltaic cells are the thin film based technology. These would include amorphous silicon, and then the copper, indium, gallium, selenide, and the cadmium, telluride types that I, I mentioned earlier. And then the third generation, which are still considered by many to be emerging, have limited applications to date, but they are starting to find homes and starting to gain traction in the market. As we look at this chart, silicon-based materials at the top fall into two different families, crystalline and semi-crystalline. For the crystalline, there's monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Monocrystalline solar cells have a uniform homogeneous lattice structure. Polycrystalline have some consistency, some structure in their lattice, but they're varying by size and shape. And then with the semi-crystalline photovoltaic cells, you have microcrystalline, which is also called nanocrystalline, and then the amorphous silicon, which has a non-homogeneous crystalline structure. The amorphous silicon then can be deposited on both a glass substrate and a film substrate. And what TDK does are the thin film photovoltaics shown there in the picture highlighted in the red box. Some of the compound semiconductor solar cells have class 3 to 5 multijunction gallium arsenide, the, the copper indium gallium selenide, and the cadmium telluride. And then finally, some of the organic types containing carbon one of the most prominent ones right now is the dye-sensitive solar cell, or DSSC, which is a third-generation thin-film photovoltaic cell type. In terms of spectral responses, this is a very busy slide, but it's also very important. As one observes these responses, there are some key points to highlight. White fluorescent light response is vastly different than sunlight response, which is vastly different 
than white light's response and is shown by the dash cyan colored curve. In addition, TDK's amorphous silicon sensitivity is maximum where sunlight's relative strength is also maximum. TDK's amorphous silicon response better matches the human eye response, and then amorphous silicon sensitivity does not match well with the higher red content white light, like we associate with incandescent lighting, that have lower Kelvin temperatures. And finally, TDK's amorphous silicon cells capture less of the overall sunlight spectrum than crystalline silicon types. So Chris, how do TDK solar cells compare with crystalline silicon solar cells in general? Where amorphous silicon PVs perform better than crystalline silicon PVs is under indoor lighting. So below is plotted a simple comparison under indoor lighting from 200 lux all the way up to 2000 lux, which is indicative of indoor lighting. The output comparison between crystalline silicon and amorphous silicon, the TDK amorphous silicon solar cell performs better under all luminance intensities. These were based on an active area of one square centimeter for both technologies, but it needs to be noted that under outdoor lighting, crystal silicon cells are more efficient than amorphous silicon. So, Chris, can we dig into the details of TDK's solar cells? Absolutely. So let's go over some of these key points of TDK amorphous silicon cell specifics. We generate roughly 0.45 volts per cell at 200 lux under load. The maximum current size available is 60 millimeters by 40 millimeters, but we have the capability to go up to 200 millimeters by 300 millimeters. But this is going to depend on the equipment that we have and our manufacturing capabilities at the time. The minimum size is roughly 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, based again on what we have currently in-house for tooling, but possible to do smaller cells if needed. Thickness will be 0.2 millimeters max, The maximum number of internal cells depends on the overall size. If you look at the two pictures below, the one on the left actually has six cells, but there's a stayback area or an insulation barrier between each of the internal cells, and that takes up real estate. The one on the right side has four cells. So again, there's a barrier in between the active cells that we need to accommodate when we're doing multiple internal cells. We're only making single junction type There are some thin film technologies that you do multiple junction, which you're trying to capture more of the light spectrum to improve overall efficiency. And then finally, we can do some color adjustment for cosmetic reasons, maybe to kind of hide it better. We could do a bluish type shown on the left or a reddish type, but the color control is very limited. So we would give you something that's approximate to what we're showing here. Okay. So... Chris, what about the key internal layers and processes of these solar cells? Without divulging too many trade secrets, we'll kind of give a quick snapshot of what both of those are. So in the construction of the amorphous silicon thin film solar cells, there's a top surface protection layer, there's an insulation layer, then we use a transparent conductive electrode, and this is with indium tin oxide or called ITO. We have that tin junction made out of the semiconductor material that I discussed earlier, then a backside metal electrode, which is typically aluminum, and then it's put upon the base film. For the processes, we sputter the metal electrode onto that base film. We do the application of the amorphous silicon semiconductor material via plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition. We screen print on an insulation layer. We sputter on the transparent conductive material onto a film We do screen printing of another insulation layer, and then finally we attach the encapsulation layer to seal the solar cell from the outside environment. So Chris, what do these TDK amorphous silicon film solar cells buy me as an engineer? Well, all the benefits that I'm going to show you here on this slide are a result of us using a plastic film as the substrate. We're talking about a thin semiconductor material being applied to a thin film and a thin metal electrode. So in terms of weight, we can get down to sub 0.1 grams for the total weight of the solar cell. When we apply the N-type materials and the P-type materials, we're in the micron levels. But overall, the complete stack up is less than 0.2 millimeters thick. So when you get into watches and some other wearables, that becomes important. Since these are done on a film and not glass, we can do 
very intricate designs. That is, we can have notches, we can have slits, multiple holes, curves, and windows, things you can't do with other solar cell technologies. And finally, again, since it's on a thin film, we're able to bend them. So we can put them into wristbands of wearables if needed to increase the area to generate more power output. So Chris, what does TDK have to offer here? What kind of options do I have when it comes to device size and output current and voltage? Okay, so TDK's current lineup includes multiple devices targeting multiple applications. So the largest that we have, as I mentioned earlier, is 60 by 40 millimeters. It currently has seven cells that can be reconfigured depending on the use case. And the smallest is 17 millimeters in diameter targeting a dial watch application. So we're able to configure these standard sizes internally, again, creating different internal cell configurations to increase either the current or increase the voltage on the output. But as we step through here, you can see that there's a trade-off as the number of cells goes higher, the output voltage goes up and the output current goes down. So it's a linear trade-off between the voltage output and the current output. We've been in the market for almost 25 years and we've had a standard efficiency type material. We have now introduced a 10% higher efficiency and that's 10% over what we're currently doing, not 10% overall efficiency. And we've improved on this through processes. We've just released a newer material set that will also give us a little bit more total efficiency, 25% over our current efficiency. And this is going to be through material improvements and process improvements. Many of the standard parts listed in this table are readily available through distribution and are in mass production. So what kind of applications do you see these types of solar cells being a good fit for? We get new inquiries and new applications often, but the ones that we've seen more of are traditional watches or dial watches, which I mentioned earlier, we've been supporting well over 20 years. Activity trackers and smart watches. These require a little bit more power because there's some processing involved. So solar cells are only used to extend the battery charge and cannot rapidly charge a battery that's been depleted from zero all the way up to 100% charge. So it's more as an extender. Power source for sensor nodes, which have processing capability. So it's gathering information and doing something to generate data from that raw data. Peripheral devices, remote controls, computer mice, keyboards, styluses. You might remember them from the old calculators, right? There was a little window that had a solar cell. And then high bay type sensors. These go into like warehouses where smoke alarms are, uh, maybe gas sensors and humidity and temperature sensors, where you don't want to go up there and have to do maintenance a lot. So you can attach it to one of the high bay lamps and have a light source generating power consistently. Some of these advantages are that it's wireless, so you don't have to route wires. It's maintenance free. You don't have to go up there to change a battery or replace the battery. It's very easy to install. There are cases that there is no battery anymore if you got a constant light source, or you only need to wake it up by introducing a light source, or you can use less battery capacity because you know you're always going to get a trickle charge coming out of a solar cell. The benefit is also that you have less charge cycles. So the death of discharge on batteries is important for its life. So if we're always trickle charging and keeping that battery charge maximized, then you can extend the battery life. And then finally, the politics of this, right? It's green energy. It's energy harvesting. So you're getting some power generated by sunlight or other light sources. So, Chris, I'm especially interested by that first application you mentioned, traditional watches. So can we take a closer look at that kind of design? Sure. So as you can see here on the left side, this is a very generic stack up of a dial watch. So what we do is bury the solar cell behind the faceplate, and sometimes they'll put a diffuser to also help remove the appearance of the solar cell. And it's just powering a small battery that enables it to prolong and even charge the small battery inside dial-type watches. If you look over on the right side, you can see the hole in the center area. That's where the dial would go through. And this is a four-cell device, so you would be generating roughly about 1.8 volts out. So what about the wrist wearable you mentioned? 
in the risk wearable space, it opens up a lot of opportunities and a lot of areas that solar cells can be placed. Being flexible, like we talked about earlier, allows us to put solar cells in the band area to generate more output power. On the top of the watch, especially where it's flat, we are able to cover the whole area behind the display or behind the colored surface to generate higher power by getting more area in this area. And finally, around the display, we have a ring solar type cell. It's actually an elongated cell, which I'll show you here on the next slide. It allows us to wrap it as a ring and put it into the vertical direction, allowing us to take reflected light off of the surface and then into the solar cell that's then hidden because it's in the vertical direction. So, Chris, let's talk more about that ring type solar cell. So the ring type solar cell is a unique approach that not only captures the direct light, but also the reflected light that comes off the display surface. And since it's mounted in the vertical direction, it enables us to easily hide this so there is no cosmetic issue when we use this configuration. One of the things that I do want to talk about in terms of amorphous silicon solar cells is a phenomenon called the Stabler-Ronsky effect. And basically, it's akin to aging. And just like aging, it decreases the power output based upon the light intensity. Higher luminance flux density decreases the output power quicker and at a greater depth. So if you look at the left side, being under one kilolux, in the end, you will flatten off at about 90% of the original output power. Whereas when you're in direct sunlight, and again, 100 kilolux, which is very high, it can drop all the way down to sub-60% efficiency. So when TDK manufactures our solar cells, we keep this in mind and we're boosting up the output power in anticipation that there's going to be some loss over the life of the solar cell. All right. Okay. Well, Chris, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Take care. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from TDK. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>